Okay, so I am going to start sharing my screen. Let's see. Can everyone see my screen? Wonderful. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us today. We have a very exciting presentation. Our Learning Together series for today, it's uh, uh, Witters Ravenel Nonprofit Grant Funding Resiliency. All right, let's see. And so housekeeping items for you today. This presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Volunteer and See YouTube channel. Today's presentation is scheduled to last one hour. This includes Q&A. Save your questions for the end um, of the presentation. Keep your microphones muted to prevent interruptions. And all materials um, for this presentation today will be shared via email with all of you, including the um, PowerPoint presentation. Okay, and today's speakers, we have Mary Glasgow. And let me just do some arrangements to be able to see her information. Uh, senior technical consultant. And to learn a little bit more about our speaker today, Mary Glasscott is a senior technical consultant for the civil engineer firm Witters Revenue. Her specialization within the funding and asset management group focuses specifically on federal grants that require compelling narratives and in-depth project cost justification to resolve infrastructure problems at local or regional levels. Before working at uh, Witters Revenue, she held dual roles in state government as the infrastructure program manager for the North Carolina Office in Recovery, Recovery and Resiliency, also known as NCOR, and as the state operations lead for the North Carolina Division of Emergency Management and CEM for the FEMA Public Assistant Infrastructure Recovery Program. For NCOR, she managed 20 million in community developed grant programs for disaster recovery. Um, due to the COVID pandemic, she was asked to return to emergency management and set up a statewide system to support the administration of 1.7 billion in FEMA public assistance projects, including multiple federal disaster events and FEMA COVID funds. Her, um, her sincere engagement style and subject matter expertise were valuable to governments and nonprofit around the state as they work through extremely complex federal requirements to execute hundreds of projects during, during her tenure. Mary's work during that time greatly increased her awareness of the special circumstances faced by nonprofit need, uh, needing grant funds being aware of their eligibility and what was required to prove eligibility. Mary's background provides uh, 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 her um, clients a, um, an experience, let's see, clients and experienced partners with uh, when navigating grant opportunities and in advancing initiatives related to infrastructure repairs and mitigation projects. Stormwater and utilities are her top focus area, and she enjoys shifting gears to seek projects funding to benefit historically marginalized communities who have experienced years of repetitive loss from storm events. Mary has a master's degree from the University of Memphis and a bachelor's degree from DePaul University in Chicago. And so Here's our guest speaker. Um, Mary, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can um, share your presentation. Let's okay. See. Thanks so much, Luz. Hostess with the mostess. <laughs> so I'm so grateful that everyone has joined. I know that we have experienced a lot over, I, I go back to Matthew. That's my starting point, 2016. There's been a great many um, disaster declarations. Not all of us are even aware of all the disaster declarations that have been going on. So I'm going to dive right into it. And the primary focus of this conversation has to do with you as nonprofits. Nonprofits are eligible for some federal grants, not others. But there's ways that the federal government and the state of North Carolina helps with that eligibility issue. And so we're going to go over that step by step. 
while we're talking today, um, as Lou said, you know, if you would just hold on those questions, make some notes on the questions. Lou's will also be watching the chat. Um, this will be, this is being recorded. So, you know, just be aware of that. And I'm really, really delighted that Lou's and um, Volunteer NC asked me to speak with you all because I have, I have seen it all. Now I'm an infrastructure person. And what that means is I do not have an expertise outside of my own volunteer experience um, and emergency response with that volunteer uh, agency or agencies rather. Um, but I don't deal in the realm of housing, whether multifamily or single uh, housing. And I don't deal, my expertise, I guess you would say, is not in the human services elements, but I'm here to talk about infrastructure. So for example, we all have facilities we work out of that we may be renting or that we may own. The parking lot, the parking lot at, at, your, at your house of worship is a mess. Um, you've got lots of repetitive flood damage. Um, now what we're talking about has to do with mitigation, resiliency, and climate change funds. That's, that's a, those are words that are a lot of times interchangeable in relation to these federal grants. We know we, we've all heard about the Biden money, um, the Infrastructure Jobs Act. There's just all kinds of money out there. And so we have until about 2026, in some cases until 2030 or 2031 with these federal opportunities. What we're gonna do is talk about this eligibility. So I am going to share my screen. I'm going to turn this into a big old presentation. And again, you guys are, um, everybody's going to have a copy of this. So thanks to Volunteer NC. We're going to talk about disasters. We're going to talk about FEMA in particular. There are uh, several FEMA regions. We're in region four out of Atlanta. And region four includes North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. And so you can imagine on the, on the coast, we are a busy, busy uh, region for FEMA. And it used to be that FEMA showed up and, you know, 300 people, 500 people got out there, stayed around for quite a while. They still do that. But we see where there is a shift from the federal government and the state agencies. Uh, state agencies have been very fortunate in uh, having FEMA money to hire more people, to have more more robust agencies and sections within those agencies. So what we're talking about is disaster recovery into disaster mitigation. So when it's not a storm, what do we need to do before the next hurricane or before the next X that happens? We've got tornadoes, earthquakes, droughts, mudslides. We've got all kinds of things that can be going on in North Carolina. So what does FEMA have on their plate? And what, we, what can we do in advance to help them help us? Um, and to work really succinctly, really closely with the state agency that manages the majority of the FEMA uh, funding. That's North Carolina Emergency Management or North Carolina within the uh, North Carolina Department of Public Safety. So we have mitigation and resilience and climate funding. So we're going to talk more specifically about the FEMA BRIC money. Now, this is infrastructure money. There's also FEMA Flood Management Assistance Grants that help with housing, um, NFIP. You can do housing buyouts in flood prone areas, but we're gonna focus on FEMA BRIC and other infrastructure grants. And if anybody has any questions about what, what, is, what counts as infrastructure, that is anything that you would own and maintain, um, could be a vehicle, could be a building, could be a playground, house of worship, yeah, we'll we'll take a little bit deeper dive into that. And then grant programs and partnerships and why we just have to get on the stick about partnerships. What's a partnership? What does it mean? And I'll tell you, local governments need you as partners. And I'm going to explain why. And that has to do with the grant applications. Oh, by the way, you'll see links uh, when you receive this webinar. You're going to see certain links. Most of them have a blue star, this one doesn't, but those are uh, live links that will take you to further information. So we know that nonprofits on the whole are viewed as um, institutions of, they're sort of a, certainly not quasi-governmental, but nonprofits fill gaps and holes that government may not be able to reach. 
And so we know what an important role, this has been known for many decades, what an important role um, nonprofits hold. But the COVID pandemic made things particularly come to the forefront. Um, about the need for nonprofits and the organizations that coordinate nonprofits for cohesion. So now I'm going to show you guys something interesting. I have the live slides. And so here we have all of the federal disaster declarations from last year. So we're starting this year. Now, if you look at North Carolina, there's nothing that happened. And I'm wondering, let me make that go away just in case. So FEMA's busy, right? So if this is the uh, United States 2023 billion dollar disasters, not million dollar disasters, not hundreds of thousands, but billion dollar disasters. This is a lot. So I'm going to make this one. What I want to do is I have 2023, 2022, 2021 going all the way back to 2016. And it shows you, it's, it looks just like this every year going back to 2016. That tells us how busy FEMA is. Those folks travel all over, they get deployed. They're extremely busy. And so whatever we can do to assist them in having our ducks in a row to make things move faster is always gonna be more helpful. This is something that really drives home to me. The last five years, every year, there's been 20 FEMA federal disaster declarations where a governor of a state has said, we gotta have your help. It's gonna break our state budget. We cannot handle this. In the state of North Carolina, it takes about $17 million in disaster damage to allow the governor to ask the president for FEMA to, to get moving in, in the state. So it's not really just a plate. Like I say, it's a big platter. Every year, disasters for from 2019 to last year have cost about $120 billion. Um, it's and probably and of course there's other costs that are not included in this. We're we're talking about the FEMA data that has been provided in relation to damage to wastewater treatment facilities and roads and bridges and houses and all kinds of other information, no matter the type of storm. And then deaths. Sadly, we've had about 400 deaths per year based upon 20 federal disaster declarations each year. So now we're going to move right into federal grants, nonprofits, and eligibility, because that's always a that's always an issue. And so we want to be real clear about what it, you need as a nonprofit to be eligible. And then secondarily, we're going to move right into partnerships and what partnerships mean. What does that mean in terms of um, the local government making an application or eligible applicants making applications um, and your success with the disaster portion when we've got FEMA in town, public assistance, individual assistance underway, hazard mitigation grant program ramping up, and then we have these other grants going on regardless. So every year there's competitive grants that are, you know, cyclical once a year usually, sometimes twice a year. The facts about nonprofit eligibility. So your nonprofit must have one of two things first of all, and that is a ruling letter or a cert, let's call it a certificate, either from the state of North Carolina, Secretary of State, or from the IRS that designates you as a bona fide not-for-profit. Non, not -profit. Um, that's often one of the first stumbling blocks. A nonprofit has allowed um, their proof to lapse um, or something hasn't occurred, and you got to have that right on the front end. So if you think about what type of nonprofit you are, and you've got a building, or you've got some kind of facility where people meet, um, or where you run your organization, you want to make sure that you've got your nonprofit, the proof that you're a nonprofit on the front end. And then we're going to talk about nonprofit eligibility requirements. So in this, I have taken out just a few that I thought might be of interest to this group about what is an eligible nonprofit. So this comes straight from the federal regulations. So you see here, essential government service facility, rehabilitation, shelters, senior citizens uh, centers, custodial care facilities. We have educational facilities. 
medical facilities. We have nonprofit hospitals, for example, that are successful in receiving funding um, from FEMA and many other funders. So all of you have a case as a nonprofit, as long as you've got that uh, 501c, D, or E. Um, there are other types of nonprofits, but the 501c, D, or E, uh, 501c3 is the most common. But there are others that can be eligible as well. It depends on the federal regulations. Um, and if you have any questions about what type of nonprofit you are, I'm pretty sure all of uh, you on this webinar are going to be eligible. But if you have any questions about that, please go ahead and put it in the chat or write it down and we can hold for the end. So for as far as FEMA Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities or FEMA BRIC infrastructure grants go, the, state, the statement from FEMA specifically reads, and I've got it linked at the bottom, individuals, businesses, and nonprofit organizations are not directly eligible to apply for FEMA BRIC. However, an eligible applicant, sometimes called a recipient, which means usually the state agency in charge of the money, or sub-applicant, which is local government, county, regional council of government, or another state agency or an authority under state law, may apply for funding on behalf of individuals, businesses, and nonprofit organizations. So there's a state statute, and there are federal regulations that talk about this. What are local governments? So local governments, if you think about where you sit and your service area, you are either rural or urban, you are way out, way out yonder, not too close to a local government. Um, you may have differing relationships with your local governments. You may have been working independently for a very long time. This is where we're gonna morph into eligibility and then the partnerships, which are so, so important. Um, the definitions of local government, we think about counties, cities, towns, but we have other definitions, and this is from the FEMA guidance and the federal regulations specifically. Councils of government, also called regional councils, have a particular um, interest in assisting, getting information, making sure that plans are done, because we know that there's a lot of local governments that have seven people on staff, the mayor is also the public works person, and there's only X amount of time, there's only X amount of staff, and quite frankly, ability, just from a, what they say capacity standpoint. Everybody needs to bump up capacity, and one of the reasons that we have councils of government um, is to help with that capacity. Councils of government are really local governments that have come together and formed a collaborative, but nonprofits could use their own collaboratives working with councils of government, but we'll talk about that as well. Now, this is the state statute that defines a council of government. And I'm leaning on regional councils only because local governments may or may not choose to be a member of the local region, but you'll notice the most important thing within the state statute state, first of all, we got 300 pages under chapter 160A, what are cities and towns? Then it talks about the creation of regional councils and the definition of what is a unit of local government. And then it talks about the specific powers of the council. And number one is very important to apply for, accept, receive and dispense funds and grants made available to it by the state of North Carolina or any federal agency or, or any private or civic agency. Now, I'm going to stop there and say that regional councils of government are busy places. We have uh, several all throughout the state of North Carolina. And each county is covered by some council of government. My hope is that you don't bombard councils of governments with the questions uh, that you might have because councils of government are very good about getting information out. Um, you, There is a headquarters for the North Carolina regional councils of government and they often have uh, webinars about grant funds some councils of government have hired staff with state budget money from a couple of years ago to expand their own capacity with grant writing. But you can imagine how busy it gets. Units of local government that don't have a lot of staff go to the council. The council, I know, are busy writing these grants year round. Some have one person, some have five people. So what we need to do is really think about the partnerships we have within our um, nonprofits 
What are your service areas? Do you have service areas in common? What are your goals for your nonprofit? What is the mission of the nonprofit? Maybe you're two counties away, but if you have the same kind of um, responsibilities or if you serve the same areas or the same sorts of folks, then you may have a partnership there if you don't have one already. We'll talk about that. Now, uh, FEMA mitigation grants. When we think about FEMA, a lot of times we think about houses and swift water rescues and um, things that occur when there's a lot of flooding. And that's okay, let's keep that in our minds. You have individual assistance, which is specifically for people related to their homes, whether they rent or own them. Uh, individual assistance is oftentimes the first group out there. There is also FEMA public assistance, which is sort of a difficult concept because most of the times when I think of public assistance, I'm thinking of people. But public assistance in this realm means public government. And so if we think again about definitions of terms of local government, a county, a town, a city, a regional council, um, water and sewer authority, local and governments have lots of um, good definitions. But public assistance is for infrastructure. And so emergency managers are key. And emergency managers are also in every county. They're employed by counties. They're employed by the state of North Carolina in regions and at local government levels. Um, I can think of many cities who have their own emergency managers. They coordinate with the county emergency managers. So when there is a bad flood for whatever reason, let's think about, put one in your head. Uh, we could have Dorian or Isaias if you're on the coast, when everybody remembers, I think, Matthew and Florence. Um, even COVID, though we had no damage to public infrastructure, infrastructure was in fact damaged because there were costs associated with an influx of people flooding into hospitals, nonprofit hospitals. We were having to set up triage units, right, in parking lots. That was a cost. FEMA covered a lot of those costs. So when you think about FEMA public assistance funding and a recent storm going back, say, a decade, what of your buildings, what of your facilities, what is it that you own, maintain, uh, what supplies do you have that were damaged um, or, you know, there was mold, potential for mold in the building because of the high water. Think about those things just for just for a minute and think about what you own, what you have maintenance records for, because those are important to FEMA. And remember, with public assistance, you're eligible for public assistance funds as long as you get your information to your emergency manager, because the emergency manager, and oftentimes that will run up to your local government. So what emergency managers who are already really inundated with a lot of work, the best thing you can do is know your either your local government that is closest to you to make sure that whatever you've had damaged is also counted in those initial damage assessments, because it's the initial damage assessments that are collected they move from the local government up to the county emergency manager, and that county emergency manager then submits those facility damages onto emergency management. So that information can get to FEMA because it's very important to understand that whatever damages are collected related to public assistance is what sets the stage for subsequent pots of funding that come to the table. We've heard about CDBGDR. That's HUD money. That's the third tranche of money that comes to the table. So first is public assistance and individual assistance. Second is the hazard mitigation grant program, which receives 20% because we're an enhanced state, which is great. So we receive 20% of the funding that is determined early on based upon the damage cost for public assistance. Then third, often, much later, because Congress has to debate and make decisions, what's coming to town with that third tranche of money. Review and think about your past experiences with storms or the COVID epidemic. What was damaged? What equipment was lost? What supplies were lost? What were your damage costs? Did you have to do any mold remediation? Make an inventory of your inventory of your equipment and assets. Do you have property insurance? Sometimes property insurance is almost unaffordable. If 
uh, insurance NFIP, if you're in a flood area, and FEMA sets the National Flood Insurance Program insurance rules. You can buy it through any, almost any insurance agency. Um, if you're required to have it, you need to have it on your buildings. And if you can't afford it, you have a need. So we'll talk about that too. And what we're going to talk about is going to bring a lot of questions to the table. Um, certainly, you have experts uh, that can help you answer those questions. Um, and anyone who is managing the FEMA mitigation funding or the public assistance or individual assistance funding, they're all very knowledgeable about what they do. And so you're going to lean on um, them for your questions at North Carolina Emergency Management. Or alternatively, there are others that can provide webinars and information. Um, after you make the inventory of all the equipments and assets, you want to make sure that you've got your deeds and maintenance records and everything that show ownership. Um, if you don't have insurance again, there's a need. Check. So we need to make sure that we um, get an insurance quote and see what that's going to cost. Because if you come together, you may have a, a big ask as partners to help with that insurance issue. And also it helps direct policy, federal policy. We know that NFIP insurance is not working well for many, many nonprofits and even certain local governments can't afford it. So the rules are if it's not insured and it's damaged, you used to get a pass. FEMA doesn't give passes anymore on, on public facilities if it requires insurance. You also want to make sure your nonprofit's records are up to date. You may not have all of these things, but articles of incorporation, bylaws, perhaps a charter, um, got to make sure that you're bona fide, as they say, and FEMA is going to ask for that information on the, on the front end. Now, I'm talking about FEMA, and if you want to learn more about FEMA, and we can dive into this um, if, perhaps in another session, or like I say, you know, um, there are other agencies that are more than willing to assist with what is it to do an application, because they're pretty complicated, especially for infrastructure. For brick, for example, you've got to know what's the cost estimate. Um, we think about grant writing and grant seeking as a nonprofit, and usually you're asking for funding to assist with your social services that you're doing. But if you have damage to buildings, that requires a preliminary engineer design or preliminary architectural design and a cost estimate. And sometimes those are hard to come up with. Cost estimates um, can be made, you know, you can have somebody come out that does construction and they can provide you a cost estimate, but you've got to be prepared when you are going for these kinds of mitigation grants after the disaster has left. You're going to submit a great deal of information. And whether you're working um, through, you have to work through an eligible applicant or sub applicant, as they're called, or sub recipient sometimes. So that's your local government, county. Um, perhaps the Regional Council of Government, but much better if you have a package of, of what you need together within your own partnerships. If multiple nonprofits, as I've said, in your area have a particular focus or specialty and you come together, then you have one ask of a local government, a county, perhaps a regional council that submits an application on your behalf. So imagine local governments everywhere need funding. They need their they have their own issues with their own infrastructure. If they have their own wastewater or water treatment plants, um, there are counties that I mean everybody's busy and there's a lot of money, so it's a scramble. But you get your voice heard by coming together. Want two, three, maybe five um, nonprofits that have commonalities. And you get together and say, now, what do we really need? And you make a list of those needs jointly. And then you're going to come together and work with your local government. Um, that's where the eligible entity, some counties and local governments have a lot of staff and others don't. And so we want to make sure we make it as easy as possible uh, for them. The partnerships that you put together with understanding of how you make applications for these sometimes complex grants uh, the applications are really, really a critical point. Talk with your local government or county about applying for FEMA BRIC funds if you have needs related to your public infrastructure. Because again, you may not be directly eligible, but the regulations state that you can apply through a local government, a unit of local government, as we 
just went over the definition per federal regulations and state statutes. Another thing to know is with a lot of, with any kind of federal grant, except a few I can think of, and that's a, a bare minimum, anything related to mitigation, resiliency, climate change, et cetera, is probably gonna have what's called a cost share. In North Carolina, we are not often, we're not really a, a, accustomed to paying for this cost share or match. And that's because when there's a federal disaster declaration, the state of North Carolina has been picking up the quote, local cost share for many years. So with Matthew, for example, it started out as a 75% federal cost share, 25% local cost share. And then I think it morphed into 90-10, but don't quote me on that because I don't really remember. My memory is fuzzy. COVID was covered 100% because it was such a massive expense that the feds picked up 100%. Um, if we think about Florence, massive expense. You know, I think over a billion dollars for Florence for public assistance, infrastructure, damage funds alone. And so in Florida, they pay, the, if the town had a lot of damage, like, you know, let's think about a town that we're familiar with. I'm going to say Bolton, North Carolina. So if Bolton, North Carolina was damaged and they're in Florida, it's Bolton, Florida, they're going to pay 10%, 20% of public assistance. And North Carolina, we've never done that because the state has paid for it. But when you go to apply for these year-round blue sky time, let's fix our stuff and make it really resilient. Let's mitigate the issues that have been occurring over and over with flooding. And let's do it with a brick grant. You're going to you're going to have a cost share. If you're in a distressed community as defined by FEMA, it's going to be 10%. If you're not in a distressed community as defined by FEMA, it's going to be 25% of X. So let's say you need $2 million for five nonprofits to come together and fix things, fix facilities, or um, take care of whatever property it is that you need to make sure is dry flood proofed, for example, or roofs or hurricane wind shutters. If you need to do those kinds of things, you're going to owe 10 or 25% and you've got to have a commitment letter ready to go at the point that application is submitted to the state agency, North Carolina Emergency Management, before it goes on to FEMA. So you're going to have to have a cost commitment letter there. How are you going to come up with that money? Well, I've got some ideas for that. Partnerships. So this is where we're going to really bounce into what is a partnership and how does it make things better for you. And what I'm going to do at this point in time is shift over to some websites that I found with some really good information. So I'm going to keep going through these slides and then we're going to pivot here in just a minute. Partnership, what it means is they need you. They are local governments. Local governments are required to fill out applications now that are unlike applications even five, 10 years ago. Now we're having to answer questions for many different kinds of grant, federal grants that say, how is it that what we're doing, how is it that what we're fixing or rebuilding or building is going to consider climate change in the future and increased rainfall? Um, increased levels of rainfall, increased strength of hurricane winds. What? How are we? How are we going to fix that? Well, that actually goes into a narrative. How is it that we have partners that are going to benefit from this money? So you're that partner, because I'd be willing to bet that the local government is somewhat dependent upon you to assist with all of the tasks that need to occur to help the people who live in the community or live outside of the community. And so that's where you start with that partnership. And a lot of times we think about competition, right? You're competing with each other as nonprofits to go after the money. The time for that is, ugh, I mean, that's really over. It's gonna be best if nonprofits can find a collaborative center. We'll talk about that. You are the partner. Um, there's many other partners, there's academic partners, there's research partners, but nonprofits can prove to be an excellent partner and make an incredible case for a local government submitting a grant application of any kind for a federal grant or a state grant. Now, I found this pretty interesting. Um, I was reading this last night. So when we think about philanthropy or nonprofits, 
here's the thinking. And then we got the government thinking. So on one side, we have a certain amount of flexibility. We're ready to start talking about this anytime. Governments tend to say, tick tock, tick tock. We've got these things that are going on. We need to do this thing in two weeks, or we need to do this thing within three days. So nonprofits see the work that you do as a very long-term commitment. Well, governments are like, okay, if we get new folks in charge, or if we get a new mayor, then things could change completely. So there's a difference in stability in that sense. This initiative is a top priority. Well, local governments have 17 different top priorities, right? Depending upon who's doing what and um, what funding has been made available already or, or whatever tax revenues they may have. And then nonprofits may think we can be pretty selective about what we're focusing on here. So, you know, we'll, we'll do this over the next six months. Local governments don't view as don't view their own uh, management of services as something that they have a great deal of flexibility on. They tend to have to follow regulations, laws, and statutes more stringently than nonprofits do. And then nonprofits may say, we, we can't pick up the tab for that. We, we don't do that for services that have not been funded. And then, you know, a, a local government, a town, a city, a county may think, well, we're going to get with a nonprofit to do that. And sometimes it doesn't work that way. And then, of course, local governments and nonprofits each think that what they do is kind of mysterious. And it's, you know, just because it's not perhaps well defined one to the other. Now, we're going to get into learning and partnering. This is simply a collection of links that I find extremely helpful. And I believe that you might find them helpful. Chaos to collaboration under the North Carolina um, grant makers website, because there's a lot of organizations within North Carolina. It's called Chaos to Collaboration. Extremely helpful. Um, and then after we finish with a couple of slides, I'm going to show you some other things. And then I'm going to pause and see if we have any questions. So grant resources specifically, very user-friendly. Grant Watch, the link's going to take you right to nonprofit grants. It's going to take you right to federal grants. It's going to show we have a link also for North Carolina grant opportunities in one big list. And then there's a North Carolina devised fact sheet for grant training. Another thing I want you to know is there's a thing called a notice of funding opportunity or a NOFO, as it's called in the biz. And every federal grant, every state grant will provide this NOFO. This is the jumping off point that tells you whether or not you are directly eligible. We have an EDA grant here, an Economic Development Administration grant, and it shows you that the, uh, the entities eligible to apply for this notice of funding opportunity or apply for this grant opportunity, because you know federal agencies have lots and lots of grants they come out with, a partnership between two nonprofit organizations or a uh, community-based organizations and a partnership between a community-based organization and one of the following. So that tells you partnership, right? To be eligible for this particular grant, it's got to be two of two nonprofits to, that have come together or uh, alternatively a community-based organization or a nonprofit and a local government or a federally recognized tribe or an institution of higher education. Now, this is simply an example of what Buncombe County has done. Buncombe County uh, came up with strategic partnership grants. I love the purpose of this. I mean, it's really smart. So for fiscal year 2025, there's going to be an estimated million dollars uh, subject to the budget that's available. And each applicant is eligible for up to X amount of money. And they talk about that in this NOFO. Um, I provide you a link uh, to this just to see what Buncombe County has done. And if any of you happen to be in Buncombe County, you can read about it. There's always an application start date and an application end date. Some of it might be three might You might get three months, but you're going to be doing a lot of work in those three months. If you are applying through a unit of local government, regional council, town, city, county, et cetera, then you're going to have to be prepared to answer their questions to get them as far as they can take that application and then get it across to the finish line for submission. Oh, and this strategic partnership grant, I mean, the purpose is to make sure that operations within Buncombe County are more cohesive, that everybody knows what everybody else is doing. And so you can have projects that align with the county's strategic plan. Plans are another thing entirely, but Buncombe County provides us a link 
So do we have anything that we can submit? Perhaps, as long as there's two nonprofits or a nonprofit through a local government. Finally, I'm showing you an example of what a grant application uh, federal uh, will look like. And then I've linked to a Department of Just, uh, Justice grant checklist and to-dos, which I found uh, pretty enlightening. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit pause. I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to ask Luz to see if there's any questions um, that you all have at this point in time, because I'd be more than happy to help if I can. Okay, uh, so I do not see questions in the chat box, but I do see a comment. Um, this is helpful for community-based organizations like ours. We can apply through a pass-through org. Uh, and this was from um, Betty Murchison. Good. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as long as you've got that relationship with that local government um, and, you know, one of the difficulties, honestly, is, is that local governments are busy. Everybody's busy now. It's beyond busy. Uh, but the good news is that you got that relationship, tee them up well in advance, get your get your ducks in a row, know what the issues are, and then work with your local government because they can submit more than one application, mm -hmm. right? Most of the yeah. time for each grant. Yeah. Well, and I think, um, you know, we've developed this relationship over the years and we were helpful with the ARP funds yes. that came down and governments were flooded with all these dollars and trying to figure what to do. And so having a track record in that regard, I think will pay the way for us to work, work with the local municipalities. That's perfect. That's exactly the way it needs to be. The problem is, is that a lot of times, you know, if we're honest about it, Nonprofits have kind of been out there, right, on their own. And the local governments really, I mean, it, it may or may not be anybody's fault, but most of the time it's not about fault. It's about time. And the way we, we jump the hurdle is by backing up and saying, all right, what is it I need? Because I've, I'm going to have to work with a local government. I'm going to have to work with my county. So the most important thing is to really get ahead of the game there and kind of think about your relationships with those eligible applicants. I bet Ms. Murchison can teach a class herself, Luz. <laughs> that, that's probably possible, yes. Because that's a success to hear about that ARPA money, yeah. Yes. Does anyone else have um, any questions in relation to the content of the presentation or wants to add um, anything else to the information? This is the time we have someone who is an expert and can assist us with. I know um, capacity building is a challenge. Most nonprofits supporting um, through disaster um, at this moment, it, especially long-term recovery groups who are um, supporting uh, with cases are experiencing challenges with uh, keeping their doors open and continue to support the, the survivors. So this is the time for you guys to ask questions in relations to how can we, you know, um, be eligible for some of the, these grants. And one of the things I wanted to thank you, Luz. And one of the things I kind of wanted to drive home in this pivot here to some of the documents that I found, um, you know, there's a lot of policy out there. There's a lot of discussions about, well, here's how you do this, or here's what we need to do. But the fact is, how do we make it happen? And so I was reading through this a couple of days ago in preparation for this webinar, and I'm going to go right to, I'm going to go past all the study and the research and all that stuff. Um, you know, what makes it so complicated is there's a lot, there's thousands of pages about how to do or how to apply for a grant or what you've got to have, you know, ready to go to apply for a grant. So we've gone over some real basics, really. But look at this, look at this way this works here in some other um, cities and states. Chicago, where I went to college. Uh, Chicago has an alliance that is separate from government. It's third party, works great because really, if it's a third party that has created, say, for example, the Denver Office of Strategic Partnerships, the purpose is for this office, this Office of Strategic Partnerships, to bring together nonprofits and the public sector to get together and say, you know what, we've got a $40 million or a $50 million ask for a federal grant. 
and we've got these nonprofits that need this similar thing or a group. I mean, it could be several buildings that need to have some work done, or it may be um, a community center that needs to be constructed to benefit numerous nonprofits. Perhaps you don't have office space and you're sharing office space. Do you need your own office? Maybe not. But does the community center, does the community need something? I mean, there's money for trails for health and fitness in formerly flood prone areas. There's funding for all kinds of opportunities. And within the slides in this webinar, we provide you a glimpse of some of those opportunities. So the Denver Office of Strategic Partnerships, the Los Angeles Office, the Philanthropic Liaison to the City of Newark, they're all kind of quasi-governmental. Some of them may be affiliated with a mayor's office or a governor's office, but at the very least, their role is to take the grant funding needs very specifically, and that's what they focus on. So Volunteer NC has a purpose. VOAD has a purpose. There's lots of purposes for many larger organizations. One of the reasons I love being a member of the North Carolina Disaster Recovery Network for Inclusivity has to do with the fact that we know there's a lot of disconnects. So imagine, and we may have this in the state of North Carolina. I'm not that familiar with the nonprofit sector, but you kind of, you see what goes on with these strategic partnerships that focus specifically on grants. So another uh, pivot, and then I think um, I'll be almost finished. Let's see. The RAND Corporation. When we talk about equitable outcomes, that's another big push. And boy, do, do nonprofits really assist with those equity dimensions. Equitable and inclusive outcomes. That is a requirement. Justice 40 is a term um, that applies to a norm, a, all federal grants, which means that marginalized, distressed, disenfranchised communities as defined by those federal agencies under a map um, are intended to create climate justice outcomes for those, for at least 40% of marginalized communities. And a lot of the federal government is hitting that target. There was a federal agency that 60% of the funding went to marginalized communities to improve historic um, issues with pollution, climate, all kinds of bad, nasty stuff that goes on and has gone on historically for many decades to rectify those issues. So that is of particular importance for any grant application for federal funds of any kind, most particularly related to communities that are marginalized. And so one of the things that, you know, I was going through this, I mean, it doesn't seem very interesting, but with all the grants that are available, the Central Climate Coast Risk Assessment, nonprofits are engaged. There is a, there are organizations for Climate Central. Um, most of those are based um, out of the NOAA office, one of which is in Asheville. And then we have the Moorhead City uh, branch. There's North Carolina Sea Grant, and there are many organizations that will assist um, on coastal risk. So I'm going to take it on down. Um, Brick was studied by this organization, and FEMA got inputs from residents, businesses, nonprofits, local governments, et cetera. But when we think about the guiding principles of these grants um, and all the tools that are available to us, this, or this document, which I've not included in the PowerPoint, shows you every grant, every eligible entity, and what's working and what's not working from an equitable outcome related to mitigation, resiliency, and climate change grants. Remember, those are going to be on the table for a little while longer. Um, I wouldn't be surprised we don't get some kind of an extension, but again, as with anything government, that depends on the elections. So are there any other um, questions, perhaps? Because um, I can also provide a the Department of Defense has grants that are specific to communities that are run up against, like, for example, um, Fort Liberty. Um, and then we have, you know, we have various um, 
in installations. Well, that's my word. Uh, well, it's their word too, Department of Defense. But Department of Defense recently came out with some really excellent guidance about what is a regional council and how do you define that? Because the money that's available to communities that abut a regional uh, or a military installation helps understand, helps us understand the purpose of regional councils and how they can be very, very beneficial. So I'm going to talk to a couple of friends that are at regional councils, knowing how busy everyone is. And, you know, let's see if we can't get a little bit more information out there for nonprofits related to partnerships and how we successfully apply for grants as a collaborative, as a coalition. Okay. Well, I do not see um, any questions in the chat box, just uh, two additional comments about uh, the great information that you have provided today. Um, anyone else given one last chance for more questions or any questions? Um, I have one. Uh, well, there's something in the chat box. Betty says, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You. <laughs> I have one. Um, you know, we talked about collaboration and applying for these grants, which a lot of times with the lack of capacity that a lot of these nonprofit organizations are experiencing, it becomes almost impossible, impossible. to be able to um, apply for these grants. Are there any resources that you recommend that you know of that can support in this capacity? So one of the things that I don't know much about, but what I do know is that nonprofits are successful around the United States getting grant money through an eligible applicant of many kinds. And so, Luz, I'm going to ask you, I would like to ask you a question. What differentiates Volunteer NC, for example, from other large, larger volunteer organizations that may or may not be able to assist with grants? Because one of the things I want to offer up is a future webinar that takes us actually into the guts of a federal grant application so we can see what it takes to do those applications and how we have to be able to be ready. If we can partner up with some local governments or a county and to remove the burdens off of those um, as much as possible, because a lot of the burdens are put on, like I said, emergency managers. Um, a lot of the burdens are put on certain counties, planning departments, or even finance officers. But what is it that the some of the organizations that help coordinate, you know, nonprofits. Like I think about um, MDC. I think about the Inclusive Disaster Recovery Network. I think about Volunteer NC. Um, and I'm curious, how do they differentiate from the other in this in doing grants? Because I don't know of any entities that really help with grant writing or grant making pertaining to um, these federal grants. Yeah, um, in the past, I had um, I had explored alternative op options because my capacity is to support right. right during disaster activation. Usually, we support the North Carolina Emergency Management with donations and volunteer management. We also support in the sense of preparing our partners, nonprofit organizations like they're attending today, to be able to get this information to them so that they can properly plan. Right. Um, and have the information. Now, in the past, I had explored an opportunity to create a relationship um, or um, uh, facilitate conversations with uh, UNC um, uh, school school government. government because they do have a program. And when I went to UNC Chapel Hill, I actually wrote a grant for an organization in Virginia that was part of my work, right? And so there's an opportunity because the students need these projects and the organizations um, need someone to help them write these projects. So- You know what? UNC School of Government just put out a thing about interns writing grants. And then Ms. Blackburn, um, I think had something to say because you know, it gets confusing about who we should go to to have specific assistance pertaining to specific kinds of grants that may not be social services. Ms. Blackburn, yeah, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the information. I mean, it's 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 hopeful to know that there is money out there, mm. um, a lot of information to take in. But as a community based organization, as you know, and just like you mentioned, so many of the community based organizations are constantly competing for the same grants. And we're also under manpower and do not have the money. So 
my question would be, what would be the really the first logical step, right, in trying to get those grants? And is there um, the third party strategic partnership that brings organizations together here in North Carolina that we can reach out to? Because, I mean, I've been on the ground for over two and a half decades merging black and brown communities together. And we were on the ground and for COVID. They had me put a team together. And in six months, we reached over 10,000 people. And, but again, again, it's the lack of, of resources when it comes to manpower and money. Right. And, um, and we don't have the expertise in writing these grants. So is there, what would be my logical first step as a community-based organization? Or is there that third party strategic that brings organizations together that I can reach out to? So excellent question. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I'm looking at what I'm seeing in the background. Mujeres que? Mujeres liderando. Okay, Lead, women leading. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that you probably cross paths with a Mexican, perhaps, or no. Um, maybe there are other um, Spanish speaking organizations that would have a similar focus. Right. Okay. So I'd reach out to those two or three of those perhaps Spanish speaking organizations. And I would get together and I would say, here's what we own. Here's what has happened. Here's what we need. Now, again, I'm here talking about uh, public facilities, but it could be anything. And then you decide who's gonna take lead on this. And you decide what is our problem? What is our need? You get that dollar figure. You do a cost estimate. You're going to pull together and determine if you have one or two grant asks, because if you combine with two or three or four or 10 organizations as a partnership, and it doesn't have to be about Spanish speaking, like, for example, whatever it is that you, uh, what is it that you focus on? Women leading, what does that mean? Um, well, uh, wellness and advocacy, we, we're constantly at the um, General Assembly also pushing back um, for equitable access to our black and brown communities. Um, wellness, um, we do um, health, uh, access to food, but not just food, but access to healthy food. We actually plant and go out in the community, show people how to plant, do um, gardens in their, in their home. Last year we did over a thousand plants um, yeah. and um, put seeds and did QR codes. Yeah. So, um, one of the things I think that, I mean, I can think of five organizations off the top of my head that you should partner with. And you may think that you don't have anything in common with them, but I bet you've crossed paths at the General Assembly, right? <laughs> Those are your partners. And what you need is to come together with a kind of committee, a loose committee, make it easy, right? Bring the iced tea, have some donuts or whatever, right? Maybe salad instead. But get together and say, all right, here's our facilities. Here's what we own. We have insurance on this. We don't have insurance on that. We don't have enough supplies or whatever it is that you may need. You're going to have one ask in a grant application, one ask, one big ask, instead of five, 10 different nonprofit organization asks. There is federal funding available for almost everything. Luz, please. So applying the same same concept, and, and I, I see that um, we have a couple of directors from long-term recovery groups. Long-term recovery groups are the main organizations on the ground supporting with disaster case management and anything that has to do with helping that local community rebuild after a disaster. And um, back then, when I used to lead a long-term recovery group, that was the idea that came to mind, like create a coalition or a group of, uh, or bring long-term recovery groups together to apply for these grants, right? To be able to keep uh, more funding flowing into the communities. So um, I see that we have a couple of people, Christie's on the call, and uh, I believe Cassandra's on the call. So um, just wanted to put out there, that's an idea and it's a possibility based on the information that we received today. And I see where Alexa Anderson has mentioned NC Counts Coalition. She calls it a regranting process to get funds to community-based organization partners across the state that don't always have the capacity. So there we go, NC Counts Coalition, Alexa Anderson. But you know, it's really interesting to me because just like Denver or Newark, 
or other organizations. In my mind, it's a matter of who is that third party that only focuses on grants, collects the needs, gets the data, parses it together and says, ah, there's a grant for that. Oh, there's five grants for that. And we've got 50 nonprofits who need the thing. That's what we, that's what we need. And we may have that. Um, in the last couple of slides that you're going to all be provided, there are there is mention of a couple of North Carolina-based nonprofit collaboratives, but look into those in addition to the NC Counts Coalition. Talk to your regional councils, but don't bombard them. Get together. Find your partners first, your internal or your, your nonprofit partners. Like when I, when uh, Anna, when you when you mentioned um you know, about healthy eating or food and gardens. I mean, my goodness, you know, there's a bazillion nonprofits that are interested in this kind of thing. And whatever those needs are, I'd be willing to bet that if you got together and had a bigger ask for six, federal, federal government loves collaborative grant applications, partnerships, a big ask as opposed to seven small ones, because you know what? It's also a matter of trust. If the federal government's going to provide money to individual nonprofits, what are the odds that that federal grant is going to be completed over the course of two, three, however long that period of performance is for that grant? It's hard to manage a grant. It's hard to apply for a grant. It's five times the difficulty to make sure that the thing that is supposed to occur with those grant funds is the actual outcome. You've got monthly and quarterly reporting requirements. Lots of things have to occur, but we're starting that conversation about what makes sense. Thank you, Mary. And I see that Chris Crew gave a good here. It says, reach out to your local emergency management, management coordinator, county or municipality, and ask to be included in the update of the regional hazard mitigation plan. We are looking for input from historically underserved population and identify goals and measures identified in mitigation plans or path to funding. If you need further information, call me, Chris, mitigation plans manager. Here's his information. Write it down. I know Chris, he wow. is amazing and uh, he will be someone that can help you. Thank you so much. I mean, really, it's like, you know what? I can't do anything if Chris Crew has spoken because a hazard mitigation plan, y'all have heard, some of us have heard of SEDS plans, you know, healthy communities plans. We've heard from everything, climate plans and land use plans and all this other stuff. A hazard mitigation plan, Chris, Chris really nailed it. In fact, well, I'm going to leave it there. Chris Crew is the man when it comes to this kind of thing. Hazard mitigation means flooding, earthquakes, tornadoes, Godzilla, who, whatever's going to show up. How are we going to get around that? What do we need? Right? Nonprofits count. Thanks so much, Chris. He's okay, cool. so thank you. Thank you. It is 2.03. We want to respect your time. And uh, thank you, Mary, for the this information. I, I, I think it was well done. Um, I was able to learn and I've been moving in the disaster realm for about seven years. I thought I knew it all, but no, you brought good information to today's conversation. And to everyone, thank you for attending. Uh, our next presentation will be March 27 at 1 p.m. And I will have a representative from Team Rubicon presenting a no-cost solution and mutual aid partnership. Um, Team Rubicon is an amazing group that supports communities after a disaster. So I hope you all have the time to attend. Thank you again. It was wonderful and I'll see you all, you all around. Thanks everybody. We got this. Yes, thank you all. You're welcome. Thanks Luz, really. Bye. Thank you.